Welcome everyone to Biostatistics and Biomedical Research, Session 10. Uh, welcome, and uh, as always, uh, if you're watching this session live, please activate the um, chat box, open that window, and set it to live chat so you'll see the most recent messages first. Please take advantage of that for asking questions and asking for clarifications. And as always, uh, go to datamethods.org to the uh, topic dedicated to this session for asking questions after the uh, live session is over or at any time, especially asking uh, more in-depth questions. Today we talk about non-parametric statistical tests. Uh, you'll recall in earlier sessions we talked about some parametric tests such as uh, one sample and two sample t-tests um, and then we also talked about tests for proportions uh, the uh, t-tests are parametric tests because they make distributional assumptions. Uh, the tests for proportions really don't have any distributional assumptions, so it doesn't really matter if you call them parametric or non-parametric. But today we're going to talk about um, non-parametric counterparts to the uh, one and two sample t-tests. Uh, so um, let's get to the notes. And the version of the notes that we're using today uh, is dated January 13th, 2020. So we're in Chapter 7, and we start with a discussion of when to use nonparametric methods. There's some confusion about this in practice, and the short answer is it's a good default approach for hypothesis testing, assuming you're interested in testing hypotheses, which is not always the case. Uh, and they're useful uh, when you just need p-values and there's no covariates to adjust for. That's oversimplified, uh, but that will get you most of the way there. Um, so non-parametric methods are those that don't require a certain distributional assumption for the raw data. What is a parametric test? A parametric method assumes that the data come from some underlying distribution. So the t-tests assume that the data come from a Gaussian or normal distribution. Now for non-parametric tests, the response variable uh, can be interval or ordinal. If it's ordinal but not interval scaled, uh, then uh, you really want to use an ordinal type of method, such as one based on ranks, uh, such as non-parametric methods. Uh, but um, Ordinal responses, um, uh, the nonparametric methods are apl applicable because they don't assume there's any certain spacing or constant spacing between the categories. Now, there's no problem in using nonparametric tests on interval data uh, so that if you have no ties in the data, so it's truly a continuous variable, the nonparametric test works fantastically well. So let's suppose you had a normal distribution for your raw data in actuality, and you used a nonparametric test such as the Wilcoxon test instead of a t-test. Well, that nonparametric test, that particular one, is 0.95 efficient. In other words, it's it's like dropping 1 20th of your sample size in terms of a loss of efficiency. Um, if normality does not hold, the nonparametric test can be arbitrarily more efficient than the parametric test. So the parametric test could have relative efficiency that drops to zero. Uh, nonparametric methods are very elegant for handling extreme values where you don't get tempted to delete data, uh, which is not really reproducible, and some would say not very scientific either. Uh, but nonparametric methods are robust and they're not going to be greatly affected by extreme values or outliers. So it gives you a very um, simple way to handle that. And uh, it gives the analyst a lot of freedom uh, because you, you don't have to know the proper transformation of the response variable. Um, and nonparametric methods really give you the same result no matter how you transform the data as long as the transformation is, say, um, uh, monotonic. It doesn't go up and back down. So nonparametric methods are uh, much more robust than parametric methods. And here's a really good example, I think. Uh, 
you're comparing two sets of measurements, so it's a two sample problem, and we've got some very simple data in sample one or group A, the data are just the integers one to 10, and in group B, they're the integers seven to 20. And the mean of those two groups respectively are 5.5 for this group and 13.5 for this group, and the two sample t-test uh, two-tailed p-value is very, very small. Now what happens if we take the data that we just analyzed and we added a single observation to one of the groups? So past 20, we're going to have another observation of 200. So now the means are more apart. So the first group is unchanged, so the mean is still 5.5, but the second group, the mean has jumped from 13.5 to 25.9. But look what's happened to the, the p-value. It's, it's now uh, much bigger. So why would adding a data point that makes the means more separated uh, not give you a smaller p-value? Because now we have more extreme data than we had before uh, against the null hypothesis. Well, that's because um, this distribution has a very heavy right tail, and this 200 is a very high influence observation. So when you're calculating a standard deviation and you calculate uh, the values minus the mean and then square that, the squaring, by the time you get to this 200 minus the mean of 25.9, uh, you square that, you get this huge number that really dominates the standard deviation and uh, makes the standard deviation blow up. And that's what makes the, the T statistic actually get smaller with this second data set. Um, and so the, the problem is the standard deviation is extremely non-robust, even more so than the mean. Um, and for something that's very asymmetric or heavy-tailed, it's not really a suitable summary measure. So the non-parametric tests are not going to have that particular problem. So we're going to um, look at an ex example. This is a fecal calprotectin data set. It's being evaluated as a possible biomarker of disease severity. And uh, when you're measuring this calprotectin, there is an upper detection limit for the measurement technique that's available, uh, which means uh, the data are going to be chopped at that value, truncated, and you can't calculate a mean from the raw data and have it be meaningful. But you can calculate a median as long as you don't have more than half of the values at the upper limit of detection. Um, so that's an issue that nonparametric methods can help with. Um, so if all you want is a p-value, nonparametric tests are actually preferred to parametric tests. And that's especially true, as we hinted at earlier, if the response is univariate. In other words, you're not doing longitudinal data analysis, for example, and if you don't have uh, covariates to adjust for. Now at this point we have to cover a very common misconception in statistics which is uh, you should be assessing assumptions of a method and doing something about it without play, uh, taking special care. So in this uh, setting what we're an example of that is assessing normality of the raw data and then deciding whether to do a parametric test if things appear normal or to go with non-parametric otherwise. Now this is really based on uh, some faulty reasoning and part of the problem is if you assess normality, uh, unless the sample size is really large, you might not have the power uh, or the sensitivity to really find non-normality if it's there. And a method that makes a decision about using parametric versus non-parametric is sort of acting like the power is 1.0, so it's that you would really know about non-normality if it's there. Um, and also, you have false positive tests of normality. So you have, uh, you have a certain type 1 error that's, that's greater than 0. Um, and so you're, you're making a branch point in your logic flow of data analysis if you pretest for normality and then decide which kind of step, test to use. Um, and this can also lead to a temptation. So an investigator who specifies that 
uh, the data were going to be assessed for normality, and uh, and then you would choose based on that. Might forget to do the test of normality if if he peaked with a t-test and the t-test had a very low p-value. So there's a little bit of temptation there. And uh, I forgot to mention that uh, another problem is the power could be too great. So with very large data sets, you might detect some non-normality uh, that's really inconsequential because it's of a small magnitude. And then this idea of testing for normality doesn't acknowledge that non-parametric tests are very efficient even under normality. Um, and then finally, pretesting for normality alters the operating characteristic of your overall testing procedure. So you'll find that your type 1 error is not going to be what you claim it is, say some alpha value. And if you calculate confidence intervals and you were to run a simulation to check the coverage of those intervals, if you claimed as 0.95 uh, the coverage, since you've had a branch point in pretesting for normality, that coverage may not actually be 0.95. Now, one drawback of non-parametric tests is they don't correspond to the usual confidence limits for effects, and sometimes the confidence intervals are harder to calculate, but that's where software comes to the rescue. Um, so, for example, you might get a confidence limit for the difference in two means, and that, that uh, interval uh, might include zero, whereas the Wilcoxon test would uh, reject the null hypothesis with a p-value of 0.01. Uh, the point estimate that exactly corresponds to the Wilcoxon two-sample test is, is not the mean and it's not the median, but it's the Hodges-Lehman estimate of the location difference. So we're talking about the central tendency of the difference of two groups. And the Hodges-Lehman estimate is the median of all possible differences between a measurement from group 1, or say treatment A, and group 2, or treatment B. So you calculate all possible pairs, uh, all differences in all possible pairs from a, a sample from group 1 and, a, and an observation from group 2, and take the median of that. That is the Hodges-Lehman estimate. That's what the... Uh, non-parametric uh, Wilcoxon test is is corresponding to. Now it's a kind of a nice thing that you can often derive and calculate accurate p-values to get a non-parametric test by replacing the raw data with ranks across subjects and then doing the regular parametric test on those ranks. That works for the two sample t-test to the Wilcoxon test, not really for the one sample test. And as I mentioned before, uh, many non-parametric tests will give you the same p-value regardless of how the data are transformed, so you don't have to make a careful choice of a transformation like you do with a parametric test. If you calculate p-values using a t-distribution, let's say for a, a Wilcoxon two-sample test, that's quite accurate, just using an ordinary t-test on the ranks. Now, when you're ranking observations, uh, the convention and what actually works best is when you have ties if you uh, use mid-ranks. So an example will show what that is. You've got these four measurements. So you have ties at 120. So your ranks are going to be 1, 2, and 3, and 4. So these are tied at the ranks of 2 and 3. The midpoint of that is 2.5. So our ranks are going to be 1, 2.5, 2.5, and 4. So that's how we actually do the Wilcoxon test. And there's a summary here just giving you an overview of the different kinds of tests that are commonly encountered uh, and what's the non-parametric counterpart and what's the modeling counterpart. So for a one-sample t-test, that corresponds to a Wilcoxon signed rank test. And we don't really have a, a semi-parametric model counterpart to that, not one that I know of anyway. For a two-sample t-test, the non-parametric analog is the Wilcoxon two-sample rank sum test, and that can be obtained using the proportional odds model. So the proportional odds model is a generalization uh, of the Wilcoxon test, and we'll cover that later.
If you have a K sample problem, such as when you're doing analysis of variance to compare K means, um, the non-parametric counterpart of the regular parametric ANOVA is the Kruska-Wallace test. And that also can easily be done using the proportional odds logistic model. Uh, now for parametric uh, linear product moment correlation coefficient or Pearson correlation R, the, there's many non-parametric counterparts to that, um, but the one that is obtained by replacing the X and the Y by the ranks within those columns uh, and then doing the Pearson R on the ranks, that is, that is one way to derive Spearman's row. So we'll get into the one sample test in some detail, the Wilcoxon sign rank test. And this is almost always done on paired data as we talked about when we covered the uh, paired t-test. And so it, with paired data, the column of values represents differences such as post minus pre or log ratios if you need to use a relative scale. Now before getting to the very efficient signed rank test, we'll just briefly mention another non-parametric test for the one sample problem, which is the sign test. It's the simplest test, really simplest of, of all tests that I know of, um, and it'll test whether the median difference is zero in the population. And it does that just by counting the number of positive differences and see if the fraction of positive differences is much different than a half, which would be what would happen at the null hypothesis. Now differences that are exactly zero have to be tossed out. We don't know their sign. And then the sign test tests the null hypothesis that the probability of a difference being positive is equal to a half. In other words, the null hypothesis that it's equally likely in the population to draw a value below zero as it is to draw a value above zero. And you can see from this formulation that we're just looking at the direction of the values in the column and so it's ignoring the magnitude completely. So any test that ignores the magnitude is going to be inefficient. And that's why the sign test is very uncommonly used. The Wilcoxon sign rank one sample test uh, is a non-parametric test that is much more powerful than the sign test. And it is incorporating the magnitudes and the way it incorporates those is that you rank the absolute values in the columns. But, but then, and, and so that's using magnitudes. And then you put the sign of the original difference in front of that rank. So that's why it's called signed rank. And we'll see that in just a moment. Now the magnitudes of the raw data matter more here than with the Wilcoxon uh, two sample test. Uh, in the sense that it really assumes you have a symmetric distribution um, of, your, of your variable. And so let's take an example with a crossover study. So we're going to assume the treatment order is randomized and we're going to organize the data so that treatment A is in the first column no matter which order treatment A was given. And then we have treatment B on the same subjects. Then we have the difference and now we have the rank of the absolute values of the difference. So these are the smallest differences. They're tied at a rank of one and two when you ignore the sign. And so that's mid rank of 1.5 for both of those. And then the next smallest has a rank of two. Uh, I mean, the next smallest has a value of two and it has a rank of three. And then the largest observation has a difference of five with a rank of four, and it's uh, the largest rank. Now, to get the sign rank, we just take the sign of the original differences and place that in front of this, and so now we have the signed rank. So now you see that, in a sense, uh, these two observations kind of cancel each other, uh, but we're taking into account magnitudes. Uh, so this difference here uh, has the the largest rank, and that's being accounted for in the signed rank test. Now there's a very uh, neat formula that gives you very accurate p-values uh, without 
making special corrections for ties as you see in most textbooks and that is to take the sum ranks and just add them up and then just add up the squares of the sine ranks and take the square root of that sum and divide it into the sum of the sine ranks in the numerator. So that handles ties surprisingly well. Uh, and then you take the absolute value of that z statistic and look it up against the normal distribution. For this four observation data set that we're looking at, the z statistic is equal to 7, which is the uh, sum of the signed ranks. So you see these two canceled out. We're left with 7. And then the sum of the squares of the signed ranks is 29.5. You take the square root of that, divide, you get a 1.29. Uh, you know, we don't have much evidence here with a sample size that small, and you can calculate the p-value using the two-tailed method, getting the tail area and doubling it, and the p-value is 0.197. Now there's a nice uh, trick to remember that if all of the differences are positive or all of the differences are negative, the magnitudes don't actually matter anymore. and uh, you can get an exact two-tailed p-value very quickly by just taking 1 over 2 to the number of observations minus 1. The minus 1 comes from the fact that we're using, for some reason, a two-tailed test here. Uh, now you can solve for what's the smallest n can be uh, such that you could get a p-value less than 0.05. We're kind of suspending our, our uh, skepticism at using an alpha of 0.05. Um, and you see that n, n would have to be greater than 5 for you to possibly get a so-called significant result with the Wilcox and signed rank test, even if all the differences are positive or all are negative. So um, we're going to go back to our old sleep data set and work through uh, an example a bit more. So we're going to compare the effects of two sleep-inducing drugs. Each uh, patient receives placebo, drug one and drug two, and we're going to be looking at drug one versus drug two and ask the question, is drug one or drug two more effective at increasing the hours of sleep? So our difference uh, in hours of sleep comparing drug two to drug one is our column that we're going to analyze. And the null hypothesis is that the difference in hours of sleep is equally likely to be positive versus negative. Uh, it's another way of saying the median is zero. So we're just forming um, our vectors here and doing the Wilcoxon test, paired equals true in, in R. So we're going to get the paired or one sample Wilcoxon sign rate test. So we see these, uh, the raw data are really uh, differences from placebo. They're not really raw, raw data. Uh, that's not normally the way you, you might analyze a, th a three-arm clinical trial, but it's actually not three-arm, but maybe placebo is more like a run-in period. It depends on the actual design that was used. So the um, Wilcox and Sun rank statistic here is 45. The p-value is 0.009. Um, and that is with a continuity correction. And um, at, at this point, we didn't ask for the continuity correction, but we got it anyway. We just repeated the same calculation because that's the default in the Wilcox.test function. Now, if we explicitly say correct equals false, we're going to get the test without a continuity correction and got a p-value of 0 0.007. So um, the interpretation is that drug 2 increases sleep. Um, it, well, the, the interpretation is that we might reject the null hypothesis that drug 2 increases sleep by the same hours as drug 1. We have a p-value of 0.008. Now we could perform a simple sign test on the data and if the uh, drugs are equally effective, you would have the same number of positive values as negative values. Um, now, whenever you have a tie, and so you have the same value, um, 
and so when you subtract, you get a zero. One unfortunate uh, property of the Wilcoxon sine rank test, just as with the sine test, is the zeros don't contribute to the analysis in any way. So even if you had a thousand zeros, even though a parametric test would give a lot of weight to that, this non-parametric test uh, ignores the zeros. So the sign test had a p-value of 0.004. The sign rank test assumes that the distribution of differences is symmetric. It tests whether the median difference is zero, as we said before. And since you're assuming symmetry, that means you're also testing that the mean is zero. But there's a general way to say what it's testing, uh, which is for two randomly chosen observations, i and j with values xi and xj um, is testing the null hypothesis that the probability that the sum of those two observations is positive, that that probability is equal to a half. So that's another way to say what the Wilcoxon sign rank test is testing. Um, do uh, all possible pairs of values of your column that you're analyzing uh, tend to have a positive sum or a positive mean. That would be the same thing. Um, and the estimator that corresponds to this way of stating the null hypothesis is the pseudo-median. Uh, the pseudo-median is the median of all possible pairwise averages of xi and xj. So you could say we're testing the null hypothesis that the pseudo-median is zero. Now if you get the signed rank statistic, which is the sum of all those signed ranks, uh, SR, um, and, and took the mean, so you just divide it by the number of observations, I call that SR bar, that is the mean of the, of the signed ranks. If you divided that by n plus one and subtracted a half, this is actually a uh, unitless quantity that's, that's a nice summary statistic. It's the probability, it's your estimate of the probability that two randomly chosen observations will have a positive sum. Now to test a null hypothesis that's not at the zero point, uh, you can just subtract your hypothesis value here uh, and now do your test on these new values. If all the non-zero values are of the same sign, as we mentioned before, the test reduces to the sign test, and the two-tail p-value is one-half to the n minus one, where n is the number of non-zero values. Now, one question we've left open is when calculating the p-values, do we want to use a continuity correction or not? So we know that in a chi-square test for a contingency table, it's not a good idea to use a continuity correction. But we see the opposite happens with the Wilcoxon sign rank test. And the way we can demonstrate that here is to run, when there's no ties, you can get an exact p-value calculation. And you can compare that exact p-value calculation to the approximate ones. And which, which approximate one, the one with continuity correction or the one without, gives you a p-value that's closer to the exact value. So when you run these various uh, examples where I'm just making up some data um, that you see here as these vectors of numbers, you can see the, um, the p-value uh, with the continuity correction and the p-value without the continuity correction, the exact p-value. And then we have the simple formula, uh, which is... Um, the, the one we talked about before, which is that z-statistic, the sum of the signed rank divided by the square root of the sum of the squares of the signed ranks. So uh, you'll see if you go through this that um, the, uh, the continuity corrected p-values are closer to the exact value than the non-continuity corrected p-values. So that's, that may be enough of a sample of data to teach us the lesson that maybe we want to use that continuity correction. Now we move into the two-sample test, uh, which is the Wilcoxon-Mann-Whitney two-sample rank sum test. 
It's for testing the equality of central tendency between two distributions, but that's not really the best way to say it. So we're going to get into some details later. Um, and so when you're, when you're ranking the data to do this nonparametric test, we're going to be combining the two samples and ranking overall as if the sample distinctions of group A and group B didn't matter. And now we're going to separate those ranks back out by group. So here's an example where we're comparing males and females, and we have these values for females, these values for males, and we get the ranks for the females. So you're ranking the female measurements among all seven, combining males and females, and these are the ranks of the males among all seven. And you see that you have, uh, there was a male value uh, tied at a female value, and so you get uh, a mid-rank for those ties of 3.5. Then we can do a two-sample t-test as if the ranks were the raw data, and you get a pretty accurate p-value doing that. Um, if there's no ties, you can get exact p-values. And it is commonly said, and it's not really right, that the Wilcox and Mann Whitney test tests whether the population medians of the two groups are the same. It really doesn't do that, but it it does that more than it tests whether the means are the same. That's about all you can say in favor of calling it a test of median. But more accurately and more generally, the Wilcoxon two-sample test tests whether observations in one population tend to be larger than observations in the other. Now, how do we operationalize that? What does it mean to say one population has values that are larger than another? That's really in statistics called stochastic ordering. And so let's get a little uh, detailed here. We're going to let X1 and X2 be randomly chosen observations from populations 1 and 2. The Wilcox and Mann-Whitney test tests the null hypothesis that this uh, C, which is the concordance probability, is the probability that a randomly chosen observation from population 1 exceeds that from a randomly chosen observation in population 2 we're testing whether that probability is equal to a half. And so if it's a half, that means it's equally likely that x1 is greater than x2 versus x2 is greater than x1. And so this is a nice statistic for measuring the extent to which values in one group are bigger than values in another group. It is the C index or concordance probability. And from a sample, it's very quick to calculate this. Once you have your ranks, you take the mean of the ranks in sample 1 and subtract off n, plus, n1 plus 1 over 2, where n1 is the number of observations in sample 1. And then you divide by the number of observations in sample 2. So that ratio gives you the concordance probability or the sample estimate of this population quantity up here. So for the data we had above, the mean of the ranks in group 1 was 2.875, and the C statistic is 0.125. So we estimate the probability that a randomly chosen female has a value greater than a randomly chosen male is only 0.125. It's a nice summary of how the two samples are separated, or the extent to which one has values bigger than the other. Now, in a diagnostic study, instead of comparing two groups, you'll have, say, diseased and non-diseased. And if you go through this same exact calculation, you'll see that this C statistic is the uh, area under a receiver operating characteristic curve. Uh, now, if the variance of the two samples are markedly different, uh, the Wilcoxon test doesn't test anything similar to testing the difference in population means or population medians, but it still tests this general notion of probability of ordering. That's why we say that's the most general way to state the test. Now, if there's no overlap between measurements in group one and those in group two, so all, all the bigger values are in one of the groups, then the exact two-sided p-value for the Wilcoxon test um, in this uh, no ties situation is 2 divided by n factorial divided by n1 factorial n2 factorial and where n 
is the overall sample size and N1 and N2 are the sample sizes for group 1 and group 2. And if you go through that calculation for the equal sample size case, you'll see that the number of samples uh, in, in any one sample must be greater than 4 to possibly get a small p-value. So let's go through an example of the Wilcoxon uh, Man Whitney test with his fecal calprotectin data. It's it's a possible biomarker of disease severity, and it's measured in 26 subjects, um, and eight were observed to have no or mild activity by endoscopy, and the calprotectin has an upper detection limit of 2,500 units. So we have some incomplete data. It's not really missing data, but it's truncated data or sensor data. But we need to keep those values in the analysis. And the Wilcoxon test gives you a good way to do that. And so um, we're going to ask, uh, are the calprotectin levels different in subjects with no or mild activity compared to subjects with moderate or severe activity? Now, if you look closely at this statement, you'll see that this is a very ill-posed question because it's implicitly assuming that no is the same as mild and moderate is the same as severe. In other words, it's assuming that you don't really have distinct uh, populations here and, and it doesn't matter whether it's moderate or severe. And that's almost never going to be the case. So you really have four groups here. and the proper way to analyze, analyze this would be with a rank correlation measure. So there's special rank correlation measures for this situation where you have a continuous response variable um, or ordinal and you have a discrete ordinal uh, grouping variable. And this here you would have four levels, none, mild, moderate, or severe, and you would just calculate a rank correlation. That generalizes what we're about to do with the Wilcoxon test. So the null hypothesis is that the probability um, of a randomly chosen observation in one group being greater than an observation in the other group is equal to a half. So the one group doesn't tend to have bigger observations than another. So we have our data, um, and we're going to break it into two groups, which is really a, a super bad idea, but just for illustrating the Wilcoxon test, we're going to do it. And we get a Wilcoxon statistic of 23.5 and a p-value of 0.006. And if you look at the raw data, you see that we have a good amount of the data at the upper detection limit. And that's just going to give you the highest rank, but they're going to be tied at a lot of different ranks. So you're going to have a mid-rank uh, used here. So the Wilcoxon test is going to work very well for the truncated data. It's just not going to be as powerful as if you had really measured all of those values because the ties are going to make the power of the Wilcoxon test go down. So we're also going to show a plot of the ranks and the test statistic is the sum of the ranks in the first group uh, minus this thing. And so that's how you can derive that uh, Wilcoxon statistic W. So we're just showing the distribution of the ranks instead of uh, the raw values. And a common but loose interpretation is people with moderate or severe activity have a higher median uh, level than those with a no or mild act activity, P is 0 0.007. That's not really accurate, it's rough. So a better is to remove median and supplement this with a C-index or concordance probability. You can convert that to a rank correlation coefficient, SOMERS DXY, very easily. And in the HMIS package in R, there's a little function that quickly calculates the C-index and the SOMERS D rank cor correlation between the group and the response variable. So we use that function like this. And we see that our concordance probability is 0.837. So that's a measure of separation of the two groups, um, how much overlap there is in the response values in the two groups. And we see there's, there is some separation in the two groups. You can calculate the C-index manually uh, by taking the mean of the ranks in the first group, 0.0007, 
and going through that formula that we have earlier and you're going to get exactly the same thing that we just calculated. Now it's not enough to just get a test of a null hypothesis and get a p-value. We really would like to be able to get point and interval estimates uh, for the uh, say the group effect that's consistent with what the Wilcoxon test is doing. So we mentioned that the Wilcoxon test is aligned with the hodges lehman estimator, which is the median of all possible differences between a measurement in group one and a measurement from group two. And there is a somewhat complicated confidence interval for that estimate, and, and that works fine. So if we assume the data come from distributions with the same shape and they differ only in location, uh, this has an easier um, interpretation. So we're going to consider a sample of four males and three females. The difference in the sample medians of the, four, of the two groups is 4.5. And now we need to consider all possible differences. We have the males going here, three males. We have four females going this way. And so by having it arranged in this table, you'll see the differences in all possible uh, males against all possible females. So with three versus four, you're going to get 12 uh, differences. And the hodges lehman estimate of the sex effect is the median of these 12 differences, which is 4.5, which happened to equal the difference in the medians. That's just by coincidence. That doesn't happen in general. So in R, the way you might uh, calculate that very intuitively is you have your data and then you say outer and that just means take the vector of male values and the vector of female values, put all possible ones from here with all possible ones from here. For each of those pairings, calculate the difference. So you just see all of those 12 differences and we take the median of that, that is the hodges lehman estimator. And so uh, we, when we do our Wilcoxon two sample test comparing the males with the females, we get a p-value of 0.15. And then um, we get this difference in location of uh, 4.79. But the uh, function doesn't really define what is meant by that. So I'm not sure how that's al actually calculated. Now there's a general way to get confidence intervals if you didn't want to uh, program very specific uh, formulas uh, and you didn't mind going to a little more trouble calculating things. So a 1 minus alpha confidence interval is the set of all hypothesis, uh, hypothesized values uh, that would um, not be rejected at the alpha level. And so um, we are going to calculate um, um, the p-value from the Wilcoxon test comparing the males with females, but for not quite all possible differences, but enough to do the job. So we're going to go take all differences between minus 3 and 15 by increments of 0.1. That's more than we actually need to do. So by subtracting the hypothesized value from the male uh, and then comparing that with female, you can solve for what values of these differences uh, is the p-value uh, greater than 0.05. And that will give you a 0.95 confidence interval for the difference in male and female using the hodges lehman estimate. So when you, um, when you plot that, you can see um, these are the differences and if you hypothesize the difference between male and female is equal to this value what do you get for a p-value and you can solve for where this hits uh, 0.05 in one direction and 0.05 in the other and then what these vertical lines are showing uh, this is the lower confidence interval so that's where it hits 0.05 over here this this uh, horizontal line is at a p-value of 0.05. And then the next value here uh, is the difference in medians. And then you have the hodges lehman estimator. Uh, 
which is the uh, median of all possible differences. And then you have the upper confidence limit. That's where it, the p-value uh, hits 0.05 by hypothesizing a difference of 15. Uh, now that was uh, dealing with an estimator that's really dedicated to the Wilcoxon test. Often we want to do something a little simpler is just uh, get something we're a little more used to interpreting, which is the median. Uh, and the median we know is a very robust estimate, estimate of location. Uh, it's not particularly efficient, uh, but if your sample size is large enough, you would worry less about that. Uh, so we're talking about the uh, median of, say, one of the samples, and we want to get a confidence interval for that median. Um, so there is a way to do this approximately that's very fast to do, which is to use these formulas for uh, which order statistics you need to calculate. Uh, and if you calculate the rth smallest value and the sth smallest value after you sort all of your data values for this one sample, it will tell you which order statistics to pick off. So for example, if n is 100 and you wanted to calculate the uh, 0.95 confidence interval for the median, uh, you would take the 40th smallest value in the data and the 61st smallest value in the data. And to look up what those data values are, and those actually form the confidence interval. And if you look at this long enough, you'll convince yourself that as n gets larger and larger, the confidence interval is going to get uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, and so, but we can calculate the confidence interval exactly without using that particular uh, uh, approximation. Uh, and so this is a formula using the binomial distribution that actually solves for which order statistics you need to pick off after you sort all of your raw data. Uh, and if we just uh, tested this function by giving it raw data of the integers 1 to 100, uh, those data values are going to correspond to their, uh, their indexes. And so we see that the exact 0.95 confidence interval for the median with 100 observations is going to be the 40th smallest value to the 61st smallest value out of 100. That happens to agree just about exactly with that approximate formula. So you see once you get to an end of 100, that approximate formula is working just fine. So that's the non-parametric confidence interval for a median. Um, and the median is, is a statistic that really lends itself to thinking non-parametrically. The mean doesn't share that property. There's no non-parametric confidence interval for the median. And the central limit theorem is not going to work well enough, often enough. Now, what if we wanted to get a confidence interval for the difference in two medians? Well, this is going to be a little suspicious because we know the median is not a very efficient estimate estimator uh, if you calculate it once. If you calculate it twice because you have two samples and you take the difference, these inefficiencies are going to add up. So you're going to get a pretty wide confidence interval. Um, and so we don't have a truly non-parametric confidence interval for that, uh, but instead of using the difference in two medians, we could revert back to the hodges lehman estimate and get the confidence interval for that. Um, so if, if we get all possible differences between sample one and sample two, we can get um, an approximate confidence interval using what we did for just the single median for one sample. Now we have uh, the median of all possible differences across for observations from sample one versus sample two. And we can, we can use that formula we had before to tell us which order statistics to use. And then we pick uh, those order statistics to give us an approximate confidence interval for the Hodges-Lehman estimate, which is the median of all the differences.
So that's a little tricky, uh, but it, it works approximately well. And you can just use a standard bootstrap. So the bootstrap method, which is a method of sampling from your own data to tell you about things, um, it's very general and it's a fairly non-parametric. Uh, the problem is it may not be that accurate. It's, it's sometimes a rough method. Um, and so you're repeatedly sampling from your original data and the way you would calculate a 0.95 confidence interval for difference in two medians, not the hodges lehmann estimate anymore, but it's really the difference in two medians, you would sample with replacement from sample one, and you would sample with replacement from sample two, and for each of those pairs of samples, uh, you're gonna calculate a simple difference in the medians, and you're gonna save that result. You're gonna repeat step one and two say a thousand times and then you're going to take the uh, 25th smallest difference in medians and the 975th smallest or the 25th largest um, and that will form a approximate uh, 0.95 confidence interval for the difference in the medians the true difference in the medians for the male and female data our median estimate is 4.5 and the confidence interval of minus 0.5 to 14.5 um, which agrees with our conclusion of a p-value of 0.15 uh, the hodges lehmann estimate you can get a more accurate confidence interval for that than what we just just did but it's not officially a confidence interval for the actual difference in the two simple medians uh, but this is how you would calculate um, these thousand differences. This is how you would bootstrap by sampling with replacement. And then we can get the quantiles. And we can also look at the distributions of the differences in sample medians, which is quite uh, bimodal. Um, of course, our sample size is fairly small. It's difficult to do much with that, with that sample size. Now, what is our overall strategy? We're going to recapitulate some general ideas uh, that we started with at the top of this chapter. So our strategy is we're not going to assess the normality of the data. So if you do not know that the data are normally distributed, it may be best to just not assume the data are normally distributed. We're going to use a nonparametric test we don't care if it's normally distributed or not because the nonparametric test works perfectly well if you have a normal distribution. And then we're going to use nonparametric confidence intervals uh, for means and medians. Uh, that would be in more that would be in more in conformance with what the nonparametric test is testing. Now recall we don't have a true nonparametric confidence interval for the mean, although you can use the bootstrap and get an approximate confidence interval. Uh, and that's talk, talked about here. In the next session, we're going to introduce uh, ordinal logistic regression. Uh, we haven't really done full justice to regular simple binary logistic regression. But we're going to bring in an introduction uh, to the proportional odds model because that is really the model-based way to get a Wilcoxon test. And as you'll see, it's a much more general approach and it even handles ties better than the methods that we just used. So I hope to see you at the next session where we'll reanalyze some data we've already seen using a model that uh, encompasses the Wilcoxon test as a special case.